You're tuned into Fork Podcast. Today we're talking with Michel Babet, health and fitness coach. He shares a story of the challenges fitness coaches can face when trying to build a successful business. It's all about your network, this business, right? It's about who you know, how many people you know. And at first I knew zero people. Hi there, I'm Sean Chris Lewis, your host of Forked Podcast, and I'm here today with the one and only Michel Babin. He's uh, this awesome guy. I I have to confess, I haven't known him long at all. Somebody, a very dear common friend of both of us said, Sean, you got to talk to this guy. He's just, he's an awesome guy. He's working in the health and wellness industry, and he's doing great. And I thought to myself, well, I got to meet him introducing him is no easy task. He's got a list of credentials that I'm going to let him tell you all about that. But um, let's turn our attention over to him. So, uh, Michel, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, so, like you said, my name is Michel Bavin, and uh, I'm an osteopath, a personal trainer, a kinesiologist, a massage therapist, and uh, a natural therapist. So... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, listen, man. You have been in this industry how long? For 11 or 12 years. Yeah. All right. And uh, all of the time here in Montreal? Uh, no, actually, I've worked in the Maritimes for uh, a good five years. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, I've moved here uh, six years ago and uh, to study in osteopathy and at the same time start my business in Montreal. All right, so um, just for some geographical context here, Maritimes, uh, guys, that's that's just out on the east coast of Canada, um, typically well known for its very kind, well-hearted people. Thank you. Um, yeah, smaller smaller cities, and um, I must say, people from the Maritimes are just that they're the people who give Canadians that really nice, nice sort of uh, you know. Uh, characteristic that we're so well known for around the globe. Would you agree, Michel? Oh, well, uh, you'll see for yourself. <laughs> well, I've seen, and I think you're a pretty nice guy. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, man. <laughs> In fact, that is, um, is one of your three keys to success. When we went for a coffee and I said, hey, listen, so do you have any sort of keys that you refer to as being... Um, those the, those elements to be successful in the health and wellness industry, and you right off the top of your head, you said, "Yeah, Sean. In fact, I have like these three key points to uh, what it takes to to make it all happen in our in our field." You want to share those with us? Sure, man. Of course. All right. So for the first one is obviously you have to be light. If you don't have a good personality and uh, people can't connect to you. You'll have a hard time with this business because you have to talk to your clients for many hours. They have to, uh, they have to have a good time while they talk to you, right? So I Absolutely. think that's a, that's a very important part of the puzzle. The second one is you have to give good results. Okay, so uh, if you're in this business but you don't know exactly what you're doing, the person has a back pain and and uh, he comes and see you, but he likes you, but at the same time, you're not doing anything to help him out. Or if the person's trying to lose weight, but two years after, he's still the same weight, uh, can affect your business because, and obviously, if you give results, people are going to be wanting to, to be around you because they want to have those results, right? So it's much easier to have referrals. Um, and the third uh, factor, the third thing is uh, you got to give a great experience. So... So whenever you see or whenever you have a client, you got to make sure that they're having a great time. Uh, if uh, let's say, for example, that uh, you're having a workout with someone, uh, they have to enjoy the workout. If they, they don't want to be there and they, they had a long day and then you're making them an exercise that they hate, uh, most likely you won't have that client for too long because he doesn't want to be there. But if you're making it very uh, interactive and, and training the, the parts of their body that they like to train uh, it can have a huge uh, psychological effect and uh, a lot of motivation. So, Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's, that's pretty interesting in that um, I just want to touch a little bit on that, on the second point, which is about getting clients those results. Because um, as you know, I've worked as a personal trainer and worked in the field as well. And 
we inevitably have those clients. I just want to hear your take on, because I, I think if there's anybody who is in the personal training um, field listening, they might relate to this question where we often have this client um, or clients that we, we take on and they're not getting results. You know, I, I've been, I don't want to say guilty of that because I don't feel like I was guilty of anything. It's just, I've had people who I've trained and they didn't really want to take in the whole package of Sean Chris Lewis. You know, they, they, they thought they knew what the right diet was. They thought that they knew the right training. They'd sometimes try and hold me accountable for some sort of lack of results that they might've had. Um, and I kind of went home and said, listen, um, if I don't train this person, one, they're going to go find somebody else, maybe bring the same attitude to the table with them. Or um, if I don't train this person, they might just not exercise. And then they're missing one of the key elements of, you know, I've, I've, I've read once before that um, training and exercise is the one element that cuts across all aspects of health better than any other singular element. And I thought if I stop working out with them, they just might not work out. And um, Or was that just me and money talking? If I don't train them, I'm going to lose that money. And uh, can you touch on that? What are your feelings about that? Well, obviously, it's going to depend to that particular person. Uh, I think it depends on if they're accountable for their actions as well, eh? sometimes they, they'll put it all on the trainer. Oh, if, the tr if I don't get the results, it's the fault of the trainer. But I believe it. Uh, the person uh, has the bigger effect on their results. Uh, so for us as coach, we have to guide them through, but we can't do the, the job for them, right? So... Um, so obviously, it's it's going to depend on also like the limiting factors. What's what's the cause of why they're not losing weight? Is it because of the thing that they eat, but they don't want to say that they eat it all, all the time? Or are they really consistent with their training? Are they training three, four times or two times a week? Or if it's like they train two weeks, then they don't train another three weeks after. Are they trying to out-train a bad diet as <laughs> one of the big ones? Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Um, so consistency is the key. And um, if you're doing the right things, you will get results. It's just as easy as it is. Yeah, yeah I, I do agree. And uh, I think the, um, I see you reaching for your, your green drink. You, you know, Michel comes over and he's, he has this, this shaker cup and he pours out this, this liquid into a cup. I didn't want to do any free advertising for any company. Um, so I said, hey, let's just put your drink in this, in this glass and this green liquid comes pouring out. And I said, okay, well, that we're going to have to talk about that. Um, we'll get back to the other point in a second, but I just want to <laughs> ask you, what, what do you got going on there? Just a vegetable supplement, you know? Oh. Uh, I don't think we get enough... Uh, those micronutrients and uh, I, I find it's a great way to add it to your diet just to make sure that you have a, a more of everything that you need uh, yeah so especially with uh, uh, the, the lifespan that the vegetables are on the shelves they lose their nutritional value so I think it's very important that uh, we supplement with a, a vegetable supplement yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's that. Yeah. It, it looks interesting. So I, 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 I gotta say, I'm curious, maybe I'll take a little sip later and <laughs> you might you... do a face though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're clear then we do work from time to time with clients who may not be getting results. So for any trainers out there who are listening, you know, and I think we've all been guilty of this. Or like, again, I don't necessarily even want to say guilty, but we have worked with clients who are just stubborn in their ways. They may not be following. Actually, they're not following the instructions that we think they should. They're, they're the worst, dude, is when they actually are gaining weight and they're working out with you. And 
you're like, whoa, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with this? And I, in the beginning of my career, you know, I, I'm not doing personal training full time anymore. But um, in the beginning of my career, I was like, I can't lose 80 bucks. here. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do? But then, you know, you'd hear some trainer on the on YouTube saying, you know, you your clients are walking billboards of you. And uh, I but is that real? Is that just easy to create this YouTube sort of presentation and say, hey, you know, you there who have not yet successfully created your career, um, you should forego that client who wants to work three times a week with you, pay you $80 a shot, and um, they're going to be exercising. Now, Okay, do, they're gaining weight. They're not getting the results. Do I fire my client? Like, really? I mean, honestly, Michelle, I remember the start of my personal training career, and I it was a struggle, man. I wasn't making money, and I had little babies at the time, and my wife had expectations on me to produce in my field. Like, is that real? Do we, like, fire a client in the beginning of our career? Well, personally, I never fired a client. So, so for me, if a client didn't get the results, then I would always have to research. So for me, like uh, a little bit of a nerd when it comes to reading and nerd and away, so, it's <laughs> perfect and uh, researching. So, so if ever the client doesn't get the results, try to find like let your ego on the side and try to find the real reason behind it. Ask the the, the client. Uh, why they're not getting the results they know why <laughs> so so oftentimes it's about communication it's about finding the cause behind everything and uh, michelle i'm eating fine i'm i i didn't cheat this week i um you know i i went to my sister's house and and i didn't have any cake at the end i'm really doing everything just two pieces right <laughs> no nothing nothing what do you do, man? You know, you, you know, if somebody is following a good nutrition plan, good, just meaning like, you know, the cutting, but you know, the most basic one, you know, cut out some, the white flowery products or things like, you know, wheat or whatever sugar. Okay. Let's just talk about sugar, cutting out sugar right away. Somebody's dropping weight. We, we know that works, but, um, you, you know, if they're doing that and they're training and they're being honest, they're getting results, but they're not getting results and they're coming back to you surprised that they're not. Hmm. What, honestly, what have you done? Well, for me, it's, I, I see it as a team effort. Okay. So it's never like the fault of the trainer or anything like that. Uh, like the person has to be obviously honest and but for me, I like to go step by step, okay? So uh, before, like, you know, the trainer would give, like, a client a meal plan that they would have to say, uh, they would tell the client to uh, change those 80 habits at a time. And, and uh, if you don't do those 80 habits, then you won't get the results. But I think it's, it's a bad way of doing it because don't forget that uh, if you change too many things, the client's will quit on you. It's just too much for them. Sometimes just changing one or two small habits is huge for them, especially if it's uh, some, let's say, like they love eating their cake, okay? Mm. <laughs> well, most of the time they don't want to stop eating that cake. So they're very ambivalent about wanting to stop. They want to stop. They want the results, but at the same time, they don't want to, the the pain of, of uh, restriction. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... So you want to go step by step. Maybe instead of cutting totally their cake, they would slowly cut back. Instead of eating, uh, I don't know, uh, brownies three times a week, they would eat it two times and then one time a week. Or instead of drinking uh, like a, a two, four weekend of beer, they would maybe drink 12 a weekend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. listen, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of starting slow as long as... It's understood. You can start slow, but you're also going to have your results are going to come a little slower. And I'm just try to be super clear about that. The more you're willing to put in, the more results you're going to get out. 
So, well, that that's interesting. I was just really curious to ask you that question because it was actually not long ago that I just heard somebody talk about the importance of getting the results with the clients. And that is number one. I agree. Results are important. But I also know that some people, some clients take time to get results. Um, they take time to learn new behaviors. Of course. And then the results start coming. So to, just for personal trainers out there who they, they're, they're concerned about that question, give it a little bit of time. Some people can take as much as a year until they're ready to actually go ahead and do something. And if you're there supporting them, you'll escort them into that phase of life where they might be ready to go. Of course, it's a process, right? Yeah, it really is. Um, So I like your core beliefs. I think uh, creating a great experience for clients is super important. And, uh, and, you know, making them want to be there is what's going to ensure that they stay engaged in their health and fitness. I have no doubt that you have, uh, that that's what kind of practice you do. Um, just, I want to, want to ask you that, um, you, you have a great list of credentials. Like I said, uh, kickboxing, mixed martial arts, um, personal training, strength conditioning coach, yoga, you read extensively. So you've got a lot going for you. Would you say that because you're very multidisciplinary that that's enabled you to to um weather the startup storms of business Uh, yeah of course Uh, so at first when you're starting your business right you have to be open to many things sometimes like you have an idea what's training but when you have your client they, they they have all sorts of problems or or they like this type of training or the other type of training And maybe in your head, you have like, you've always trained this certain way, right? But uh, it's not always what the client wants. So you have to be open. You have to be able to be flexible and really listen to your client what they want. Empathy is the most important key when you're a coach. The more you listen, the more you know what the client wants and what they need. So, um, So for me... I always listened to my client. They needed a certain thing. So I would go and research like that. I was able to, to give them what they needed and what they wanted. And, uh, and obviously, uh, at first, you take whatever client you can, right? You have to be flexible. You can't say, I only train uh, professional athletes. You have to pay the bills, right? But um, uh, so you have to be able to really be flexible and and let's say uh, uh, at first, uh, most of my clients were uh, staying home moms that wanted the Brazilian booty. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so I had to learn everything you could know of about how to train glutes. Uh, I became really good at it. I, I experimented on myself and I made, uh, I helped clients to, to get Nice glutes. uh, I'm going to stop you for a second because now pretty much anybody who's listening is saying, what is the best exercise for my glutes? Is is there one? If I was on an island and I can bring one exercise apparatus that would work my glutes on the island. Sorry, I can't help you. (laughs) Because everyone's glute fire a different way. Mm. If you have like an EMG... Uh, whoa, whoa, what's an EMG? Uh, something that can uh, sense the activation of your muscle. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, different people activate differently. So you have to try many different exercises for glute activation to find which one works the best for you. So um, some people can be a hip thrust, like someone can be uh, a kickback. Uh, it right. really depends. Some people works better with small elastics. Some people like a big barbell doing hip thrusts, right? So it all depends. Oh, very cool. Actually, I like that. That, that, sound, that makes sense, right? The, the human body is designed to move in multiple different ways to just think that there's one exercise. It's just going to bang it out, and that's going to get you the best results. Yeah, everyone's so different. Man. Yeah, yeah. Now, listen, I um, again, you're relatively new in the industry, a uh, 31-year-old came in, started your business from scratch here in Montreal and, and you know, rose above. Couldn't have always been easy. Oh, no, definitely not. <laughs> no? Um, 
Well, listen, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get too personal, but I, would you, would you be willing to share some of your deeper, darker moments <laughs> of the, because again, I think that people who are listening, especially if there's anybody in the industry who's um, trying to make a go of it, it, it's like any other business, right? It's a, you know, it might be the new upcoming business. It might be the most popular growing industry. As the population gets more obese, we need more fitness professionals. But no matter what, it's it's just no business is easy, and the fitness industry business is is definitely no different. Well, I'll be glad to share a few stories about uh, myself and, and what I went through. So there's two phases to my journey. So I had two big journeys. Uh, the first one was in New Brunswick when I was working in a big, uh, big box gym. So it was Good Life Fitness. I worked there for five years and uh, started all the way at the bottom. I didn't, I was getting paid very, very low minimum wage uh, just for training a, a few clients. And, uh, but I didn't, I didn't care. I just wanted to work in the health fitness industry um, I just wanted to be in my field you know so slowly I built up my way had many clients but I always felt a little bit that there was something missing and uh, I think it was uh, because the corporation is a, a little bit uh, you know uh, I, I find that the authority and everything had to be uh, done a certain way and for me, I, I like freedom. I, it's very, it's something that's very important for me. So, um, so I had to leave. I, I, I built myself up and was uh, one of the top trainers in the Maritimes. And I dec decided to leave that all uh, and move to Montreal where my girlfriend was. And uh, decided to study in osteopathy and start business from scratch. You moved for love? Move for love. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it can good. make you do crazy things, you know? Yes, it can. It can definitely. It can <laughs> even make you move from the Maritimes and come to Montreal and start a business from scratch and uh, and put you to the test, man. That, so are you and your girlfriend still together? Of course. Or is she in the industry? Uh, no, she, well, she is, a, a, she's studying in natural party right now, but uh, she works at the children's hospital in the radio oncology department. So, uh, uh, she's a technician in radio oncology. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, so she has a stable job. So at least it was good for me when I moved here, because obviously when you start a business, uh, nothing stable. <laughs> you know, right in that, I think is a really key piece of information for me. My wife, Annabelle, um, was always super supportive in whatever I was doing. Man, she wanted me to succeed, and she certainly wanted to see the the you know growth in in my business and bringing some money in the house uh, obviously that's a, we we need to work for a living and we need to be productive and successful but um you know just to have the freedom to be able to do what you do and they and often in our in any business I think there's always one of the partners who's picking up the slack in the beginning, right? They're doing something and sometimes they might not even be particularly happy in what they're doing, but they're doing it while you're trying to figure your stuff out. And I think that, I think that's a really key element. And when you come home and you're not appreciative of what your partner is doing for you to enable you to do what you're, you're passionate about, I think if you lose appreciation for what they're doing, I would believe it can create stresses in your home and in your personal environment that could actually lead to you not succeeding in your field. It's not about what you know and how great you are. Sometimes it's just you're not nurturing a healthy environment around you and that unhealthy environment, social environment I'm talking about, comes in on you and it actually causes your failure. Of course, I think uh, the, the support is extremely important, right? The, the, if my girlfriend wasn't as supportive as what she was, uh, I don't think I would have made it or probably uh, another person would have <laughs> left me because life was too chaotic, you know what I mean? 
Wow, give her a shout out. What is her name? Veronique KC. Veronique <laughs> KC. And uh, she is again an oncology, radio oncology where? Technician uh, in the... Uh, at the Glen Hospital. The Glen Hospital here in Montreal. Very important work being done up there, guys. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so a shout out to her for uh, yeah, it wasn't... letting this awesome guy do what he loves to do. Very yeah, important. She was very supportive of me and my dreams. I, I wanted to help others. I wanted to make I wanted to, I definitely didn't want to do anything else but being in the health industry. And uh, yeah, she was supported, supported the whole way. It wasn't easy, obviously. No, no. <laughs> but uh, did you ever feel like it wasn't going to work? Uh, you know what? Uh, no, I've been with her for eight years. and uh, <laughs> not, not, not the relate. <laughs> uh, let me be clear. Not the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The health industry. Uh, the health uh, industry. Yeah. That would be a pretty blunt question. You know, do you ever feel like you guys are just going to break up? <laughs> Well, it wasn't always easy. Obviously, we had our fights. And... <laughs> okay, I'm going to go and stop you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so tell me, in, in your fitness industry business, do you ever feel frustrated and that things just weren't oh, happening? Well, of course, and... eh? So, so it's, an, it's all about your network, this business, right? It's all about who you know, how many people you know. And at first, I knew zero people, right? So... The first year was very difficult. I didn't know no one. I had to go into gym. Uh, so obviously, I, I I didn't have any job. So uh, so I decided to be a freelancer and work for a couple of companies to um, to provide my services, either teach group classes or uh, give massages or osteopathy treatments. And uh, uh, so yeah, I I was go with the flow of my my. Uh, I, uh, the thing that helped me the most, I think, was the fact that I, I was very mobile and fluid in, in my way of thinking. I was able to take anything that came to me. And uh, yeah, so so the first year, like I didn't know anyone, so I had to take whatever was in front of me. I uh, And the second year, obviously, you know more people. And the third year, you know even more people. So every year it becomes better, but it's the first Two years that is always the most difficult. If if you can weather the storm of the first three years, you're good. You're gonna be good in the, the industry because there's enough people that knows you just by networking and talking to people and and uh, helping others and the referrals and all that. So yeah, you know, um, as just as you're talking about when you first started and you didn't know anybody, I just kind of brought me back to this like bit of a dark place. I remember when I was first starting and ah. Um, uh, I, I didn't have any any clients. I mean, I had maybe one client here and there, and I, I it was often somebody who couldn't even afford a full service of personal training. And um, I just remember um, sometimes feeling really ashamed. Like, I just felt really embarrassed at times for not being successful and that I even found myself exaggerating to people when they'd ask how it's going. I'd be like, yeah, it's going good. I'm, I'm starting up with a couple of new clients. And, and, um, I mean, that's going back in a bit of time for me. I, I don't, I, 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 it was for sure insecurity. There was definitely that. Um, but yeah, I, I really felt, uh, I felt the shame at the beginning of the business when things weren't going well. Um, I don't. I don't know. Is that is that just me being brutally honest, or did you ever get there in your head? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, well, uh, you think that everything's going to go well right away. Everything's going to fall in place, and uh, and the money is going to come right at your laps, and you're going to have tons of clients the first year, and everything's going to go well. But money, dude, I'd have been happy with just a hundred <laughs> bucks. But a then week. the reality hits, and uh, and uh, you see that it's definitely a lot of work at first. Your back is against the fence. You don't know when you're going to have uh, uh, money to pay the bills or if you're going to be able to eat, right? So <laughs> definitely difficult. Do you know, do, can you recall? I, I mean, I can recall right when my business turned. I, I can remember it to the day practically. Obviously, it wasn't that day. It was the cumulative effect of all the other things I had been doing that finally started to yield some result. But do you remember when things started to turn around for you? Hmm. I think, 
Yeah, it's very tough. There's so many events <laughs> that created it, but I think what helps you weather the storm the most is have faith in your capabilities and have faith that that you're going to be able to take any obstacle that comes in your way because there's many obstacles and and life is tough sometimes it'll beat you to the ground but it's about but talk can- about that for a second because i i i man i've always felt gratitude towards like i just said with my wife and like anybody who came along that was willing to give it a shot with me. I always felt this deep gratitude and I always truly believed inside that it was going to work, that my business was going to work. Um, but anything in my life where my gratitude wasn't attached never worked. It seemed that I needed, I needed to accompany faith and gratitude to, to really be able to endure the turbulence of, of, of any startup or any kind of life endeavor. Do you, do you practice gratitude? And of course, every day, every day. Oh yeah. How, how do you practice it? What does that look like? Well, every time I train a client, I'm so grateful to, to be able to work in this industry, you know, like helping others and, and, uh, having a great girlfriend that helps me every day. Uh, and that I love a lot. And, uh, just it's about attitude as well. It's, it's about seeing the, uh, the the positive side of things. I think uh, uh, a lot of people are negative in this this world, and uh, it's important to to see the good things like that. You're able to keep on going forward, right? So, yeah, um, uh, <laughs> yeah I I think like with that that the whole negativity thing. I've I've it's it's really come into its you know it's it's really come about recently where you know like people are made to feel ashamed if they complain about anything you know <laughs> and i i'm like I, I i caution people i say listen you know in in conflict there's people who just chronically complain i get that that that's a that's a thing that's a problem um but then there's people who are like hesitant to express um discontent or things where and i'm i'm always i'm often concerned that if we lock that away and don't let people express um their their feelings that might not be positive that um that they they can't get the changes going because right it's a meritocracy today like if you're not successful it's your fault (laughs) you know i I, to a degree i agree with that to an ex to a degree but um i think people need to be able to not complain but express that there's there's two actions right yeah yeah so there's two things that makes you change pleasure or pain yeah if uh, so gratitude is is uh, making you change through pleasure right thinking about the good things so it's pulling you forward but uh pain as well i think maybe it's pain that helped me move through bad times i was such in pain you know i when you can't pay your bills and your girlfriend is with you, but you're, you, you'd like to have a, a good life for her and, and then uh, you're not able to, to provide, uh, it's very, very painful. So for me, it made me, like I said, I had my back against the wall, so I had to push forward as hard as I could, took any clients that I could. I would travel. I, uh, my, uh, like I said, uh, think, uh, I had a car, right? So I, I could go at client's house. I would... Uh, at some point, I I had eleven jobs. Think about it, eleven different places. Eleven was... jobs going on at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, I had no choice. You know, you, you have to find a way to uh, to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Uh, yeah. I I agree. Eleven. That's that's 11 pretty jobs. crazy. That's, yeah, I counted that once, and I took whatever came to me. And I, I, I remember, <laughs> I remember when I was starting my career as a personal trainer. Um, I was driving like a sandwich delivery truck, and I think that was like those were hard moments for me, man. Like I was really struggling internally with the fact that I saw myself as being this world-class trainer and I was going to put athletes on the podium. And here I was like, uh, you know, on Christmas Eve, uh, delivering turkeys to 
people's homes from a catering company that I was working for. And my wife was calling me saying, we got to, you know, I got the girls dressed. They're ready to go out for Christmas Eve dinner to my parents' house. And I'm like, sweetheart, I'm in the, you know, I'm not going to make it home for Christmas Eve dinner. And um, I know that doesn't sound like a big problem when we put it on the scale of global problems, but when you're trying to keep your mental faculties and stay excited about what you're trying to accomplish in life and you're just feeling so down about what you're doing, um, man, like you just mentioned, you're providing and helping and make giving your 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 family something big you know providing for them in a way that makes you feel good about yourself when that's not present man that's that's brutal of course <laughs> but um but i think uh in, i know a lot of people are like follow your passion if you're not doing your passion uh uh stop stop what you're doing or whatever you only do your passion but i think uh income is very important at first so even though like you have a full-time job but you want to move into the the personal training business or or, or a massage therapist or, or whatever you want in the health industry it's okay to do slowly a transition you have your income coming but slowly on the side you have three four clients and then it builds up and builds up till you have enough income that you're able to stop one place and then you have to do things that Like, well, I think one of the things that sometimes we, I, I mean, I want to include myself and say we, because I don't like when people say, you know, you know, people's problem. I don't like that. I, I think we all have a problem. And, and um, I think one of the things that we think is that when we're, when we're going to start a business and it's going to be ours, it belongs to us, it's going to be mine. Now I can call all my shots. Now I don't have a boss. And I... I feel in many ways I have more bosses than I did when I was working for a boss because every client, every person watching this podcast or listening to the podcast is kind of a boss because you're trying to please them. You're trying to provide something for them that you, you're hoping brings them value. But when you go to your, to your job, You don't necessarily have to bring that into your job. You have all these different departments that create the infrastructure for you to per perform your job in. Does that make sense? Of course. But uh, it's also about dependency. Eh? If you only have one boss, but the job's not going well and you get fired or anything like that, then uh, oh. you're very dependent. You have to... You, you can be very insecure about what's going on and be very fearful. And there can be a lot of power games playing with that, you know. So I think having many boss creates freedom in a way. Like if you think about every client in a way is your boss. Well, if you lose one of your boss and at the end of the world, you have many other bosses. <laughs> yeah, you hope. You hope. Yeah, you, you hope. <laughs> uh, obviously not at first, but uh, but when you have a big enough clientele. <laughs> I like that point though, Michelle, because you're, you know, you're, you're... It's about being independent. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's about being independent and bringing the greatest value to what you do for, for people so that you, you can ensure that, like you said before, about being multidisciplinary and being able to bring multiple things to the table and perform and and make your rule number one is people want to you know they they got to have a good i think that was number one right a great experience when they come in to to train with you yeah, they have to like you you have to give good results and they have to have a great experience yeah that was okay number three there that, oh, that well they're experience. all yeah i got it they're all extremely important i've saw i've seen some trainers that are extremely nice, have a great personality, but you see them train and their clients are all crooked. Yeah, yeah. Um, and their workouts aren't really that great just from what you can see, but the clients keeps on coming. They get great results, but it's because the trainer is so nice and has such a great personality. That oh, so you, you got to have maybe two of the three. Maybe two of the three. <laughs> or, or actually, three. If you have all three, then you're the ultimate trainer. You're able to have great experience, you give great results, and your business is going to fire. It's going to go up fast. Wow, I like that. That that is so. Let us just sort of conclude with this this question that you know, 
for, again, a forked podcast. We're really just always trying to tell people, listen, you're going to come to forks in the road. Actually, Yogi Berra, the famous baseball coach, said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Um, I always thought that was kind of funny because, you know, it doesn't matter what fork you take. It's who's who's on the journey. You know, if you bring your best self to the table, I believe you'll always find your way, um, no matter which which fork you take. But um, to help people listening who who are, you know, maybe trying to get in the best shape of their lives or trying to change, do you? Do you have any advice for them? Well, uh, I think uh, I thought about it and I think purpose is something very important when you have a fork. Because if you think about the human mind, it's very irrational. You can go at every every direction at any time. You can choose to do uh, go a certain path or you can choose to go in a certain way just out of the blue, Okay. But I think when you live life with purpose, it brings down your options and you know you know much more which direction to take in life, okay? So maybe you have uh, uh, four or ten directions, but, but at least you have a direction to go instead of having a thousand directions to go, you know what I mean? Yeah. And who knows? There's so many options in life. You have... You have to have a direction, but you also have to leave some openness and flexibility of taking whatever life gives you at the same time, you know? So, um, so when you live life with purpose, everything falls. You're able to, uh, your actions are so much cleared of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So, so building purpose, um, how does, how does, how does one say, listen, you know, I, I'm sitting in a job that I'm not happy with. I I I get home. I'm tired. I just want to switch on Netflix and and disconnect. Uh, the the challenge. I don't even know what I'm good at. I, I I like you know this is this is real. You know, like I don't know what I'm good at. I I haven't explored any other talents or all I know is I've been doing this job for a long time and I would like to experience some change in my life, but I, I don't know what my purpose is. How do you find, Michelle, <laughs> how do you find purpose? Well, tell us. <laughs> well, I had to dig deep for myself. I study a lot of psychology and it's a subject that's very dear to me. And um, so there's a couple of ways to find what's your purpose or life's task. Okay. We're all listening. <laughs> We're all listening. So the first one I'm going to say is uh, you got to go way back in the past. How were you when you were a kid? What made your eyes light up? What could you spend, like what activity you could do that time wouldn't exist? You could do for hours. You, you could study and maybe not even realize that it was 3 a.m. in the morning because you were so captivated about that subject, uh, let's say for, um, for uh, anyways, uh, <laughs> who are we trying to think of? It's uh, the one uh, that created the, the theory of evolution. Uh, uh, Darwin? Charles Dar Darwin. Charles Darwin. So he was very captivated about fossa, fossils when he was a kid. And... Um, he could study those fossils for a long time and time would pass by and he loved that he loved it so much but then later on life came and his dad wanted him to do a certain job wanted to be a, a priest or something like that and, uh, and then he had an opportunity to to go on an adventure, a little bit like the Hobbit, you know. <laughs> oh, the Hobbit! Gonna get into Lord of the Rings here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he took the journey, and he had to follow his heart about finding those fossils and new species on on islands far away. And he decided to take that uh, adventure. So he followed his heart. He fo followed what he wanted, what he was doing when he was younger. And uh, another thing that you. Uh, that can help you guide yourself a little bit towards your purpose is uh, some a sub uh, 
an event in life that was very, very difficult. Okay. And you lived through that and you found a way to go over that obstacle. When you go over that obstacle, you felt like, uh, like almost like a, a sense of power because uh, you were able to, and you feel very strong because you were able to go over adversaries. And, uh, and so a life's task could be helping another person going over uh, those obstacles. So it could be that you lost 50 pounds and then you want to help others lose those 50 pounds. So, um, so a little bit about my, uh, uh, my journey is when I was four years old, I got my neck uh, fixed by a chiropractor and uh, I couldn't move my neck before. And then after that, I felt so good. And since I'm four years old, I, I was always, I always wanted to help others with their pain and helping them uh, be able to, to be more mobile. And I remember that I was walking on my parents' back since I'm four years old, just cracking their spine, <laughs> walking on their back or, or massaging someone's strap. And then, uh, and yeah. So another thing for the second thing is I was always extremely small. So I was a toothpick. I played a lot of football and wrestling in my high school days, and I was always the smallest guy on my team. And uh, I didn't. I wasn't really confident about myself uh, with girls, and yeah. so so I decided to start training when I was 15 years old. I, I started eating as much as I could. I I tried many things. Obviously, uh, it didn't always work, but. Uh, but it uh, was something that was very tough being a, a nectomorph. And so I started training. And then at first it was a little bit for ego, testicle reasons. But, uh, but with time, I, I, I felt so good training. And uh, I, 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 it helped so much with my confidence. Uh, I broke up with uh, my girlfriend at some point and I didn't have any more confidence. So I decided to train all out. And... Um, and I decided to help others with that. Uh, with the so you movement. learned from the pain, right? You learned from the pain. You, you're, I, yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, I think learning in that pain. That that's. I was looking at the Pixar movie wheel. You know where they they have a hero of the you know, and the hero needs is asked to go on a quest, and the hero goes on the quest, and during the quest, they're challenged at their core, but they haven't changed yet until there's this moment where something really big happens and challenges the hero to have to change the way they think, and then they have to let go of something. Well, actually, they have to step into chaos, step the into unknown. Cha <laughs> step into chaos. You stepped into chaos the day you uh, came to Montreal oh, from yeah, Moncton. I didn't know what I was getting into. But How was it being a small town boy coming to Montreal? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Like Over New Brunswick, it's very family-oriented. Everyone, uh, like, you don't walk in the streets and having someone walk next to you and you don't say hi to them. How are you doing? Okay, but here in Montreal, <laughs> there's yeah. so many people, right? Sometimes you're you're just a net. <laughs> yeah. People don't even recognize you. You walk by. At first, I was looking at everyone's faces at Costco and being like, <laughs> "Do I <laughs> do I know that person?" Or but then, they were just mad because they were doing the math. The, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> they were doing the math of what yeah, was yeah. in that. <laughs> but down the years, then I was like, "Oh, I didn't even start looking at people's face because I was like, oh, there's no chance that I know someone." You but became once in a one while, of them. You, you became, I became one of one them. them. No, no. <laughs> no, no, I'm still uh, family oriented by heart, but. Um, but obviously, like, it's a little bit more business-oriented here, so I had to learn the hard ways, And um, but uh, everything's good. I'm adapted now. <laughs> You're fully adapted. <laughs> well, listen, man, um, last thing I did say before as a last question, but allow me to ask just one more. Any fitness professionals out there who might be listening in the struggle, they might be driving a sandwich truck right now, dreaming of the day they're going to put athletes on the podium, and they're just saying, man, I just is this going to work? Give them one piece of advice to keep them holding on, and we need them in the industry. We got to change the world. So what do you tell them right now, Michelle? Oh. Well... Be flexible and be open. If you're not flexible, you break. So whatever idea that you had about fitness 
make sure that you're able to 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 take what even if it's you only want to train i don't know like professional boxers make try to be really open to what you do and be flexible be able to adapt to each client and uh and uh give them what they want and need instead of what you want to give them if you're a personal trainer it's not fitting the client to your program it's training the it's making the program fit your client so it's personal training it's personalizing a, a program to the client and not that i i have this big circuit training and i have this uh, woman and i'm going to train her like a, a professional athlete and then you destroy her and you're like oh, i'm a tough trainer and uh, i want to be known as someone that kills people you know but um, i think yeah uh, it doesn't make for a great instagram <laughs> post when you're just slow and easy is winning the race right <laughs> but uh in reality that that is the situation so i think it's uh, something that every trainer has to go through a little bit at first i was like that a little bit at the beginning i wanted just to push clients and and always uh, giving them an extremely tough workout and that was the definition of a good workout but i think uh, i don't think it is <laughs> yeah well listen michel um any uh, any ways that people can get in contact with you i'm going to put that in the show notes for everybody so um we're hoping that uh you just keep gunning this and changing people's lives and you know i can tell you haven't known you long at all but You know, I've I've just see you as this awesome guy, and I I want to wish you all the best in this industry and in changing people's lives and continuing to change your own life and providing, you know, that success that you're looking for to yourself and your family. Thank you. Um, well, if you want to contact me, uh, Facebook is always the best way. All right. Um, Michel Babin, my name. Oh yeah, I'll put that down <laughs> because the non-Quebecers are like Babin. How do I spell Babin? B A B I N. <laughs> as easy as that, folks. So, Michel, listen. I want to thank you once again, and uh, we're gonna have you back on. That's for certain. It's done already, man. I could speak to you for hours, my friend. All right, my man. You have a great day, Michel, and hey, great too. day to everybody out there. Thanks for having me, man. All the best.